back with you uh, after vacation time. I want to thank Chris for preaching the word in my absence. <coughs> I the scriptures and that they minister to you uh, as the scriptures predictably do. Today's kind of an eventful day also for a couple of individuals who are leaving us today, uh, leaving us this week. Uh, perhaps Laney, who is running sound back there, is going bye-bye. She went off to college, and uh, so we're proud of her and the church of mom and dad as they have to navigate that. And then Danny Vasquez, our drummer, is headed to Missouri uh, to be shown what it is to go to boot camp. He's got one more Sunday with him. He does have one more Sunday with him. Okay, then. <laughs> Don't say anything nice to him. Okay. Uh, not yet. Not until the weekend. <laughs> Oh, so next week we'll have the Sounds of Vacation Bible School here. Uh, you'll enjoy that. So, um, again, thank you for your prayers for us. We just, um, we went uh, south, just got rained on, blown around every day, Fort Myers, Bonita Beach. Beautiful, beautiful, but it was every day to wake up to 80, 90 percent rain chances. And, uh, but when you're on the beach, you know you're going to get wet anyway. And uh, we were down in kind of an old folks area. I love it. I said, is this retirement, babe? Because this feels good. <laughs> the pool was 104. Oh, oh. oh. what? Well, nothing wrong with that. It's raining out. You're being hit with these cold, you know, stuff from 30,000 feet dropping on you, cold as ice. And you're just sitting there at 104 on a noodle. Just, I just did this. I just hung like a jellyfish in the deep area, just hanging on a noodle. <laughs> I didn't care. My eyes were closed. We're going to the beach. We're going to do whatever. I'm just, so everybody had to swim around me. Just like, you know, I'm just sitting there, and I could feel, you stay in one place long enough, you can feel the jets in this big pool. You think, you don't even think about it, but when you stay still long enough, you realize, oh, I'm being pushed this way. And then you're back here, and then you're off to the edge. Then you bump into some woman who's been sitting there. I had my own face. <laughs> So uh, but we had a great time, great week, and uh, good to be back with you. It's good to be back for Father's Day today. Um, happy Father's Day to all our dads. Father's Day, um, my mom's birthday was yesterday, so it all kind of dovetail. I, I ended up kind of talking to both mom and dad together. Uh, we all will today. Dad, I called him this afternoon, talked to mom yesterday. But Father's Day does give us opportunity to just kind of think back about fathering, about our fathers. And I mentioned this to the guys this weekend. We had a great weekend. Russ Leonard did a great job with our golf tournament. Uh, I don't know if he's here or not, but anyway, it was a great uh, time of golf together. Got to go out and kind of swing myself a little mildly, carefully, very carefully. I had to say that every swing so Deb would, uh, you know, feel assured. I said, do you want me to call you every hole and tell you how I'm doing? No, I, I trust you. Dot, 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 right? <laughs> okay. But it was a beautiful week, good Friday night barbecue. But one of the things we talked about is Father's Day. Mother's Day, um, people come or go to church on Mother's Day. Maybe they come to honor mom. You, you tend to think of mom as, is mom still with us? She's not. It's kind of sad. It's because mom has already gone to be with the Lord or she's gone on that way. Uh, or basically, um, Maybe you're elder, maybe they be in a home. Father's Day, sometimes the feelings can be very difficult because, frankly, for a good part of our population, a large part of the population, a good part of us, most of us, grew up without our birth father. Somewhere along the way, a divorce took place, or a death, but ultimately, but I would say today, predominantly, for the most part, divorce took place, and so you're not living with your father. You may still be in contact with dad, but when you think of, yeah, dad's a good father, dad's a great father, he's a great dad, well, you, you love your father no matter what, inherently, in some ways, you, you still have to just say, I can't hate myself, I can't hate my own birth, my own existence, someone had to, to play a role in that, so you can at least on the baseline say, father, whoever you are, wherever you are, even if you never knew your dad, Mm, thanks for just being the means by which actually God brought me into existence. Some of us just popped out of the sky. A stork myth is truly not true. Okay? So every one of us, whether we have something to actually um, remember in a very positive and profound way, or whether we're just kind of like, 
I'm just glad somebody fathered me so I could be here. For most men, you're still going to have to learn either. You're going to choose to either you know, be a kind of man, be a kind of, um, hopefully a follower of Jesus Christ, and then you're going to be a kind of father. Now, there's not a lot of scripture text with respect to fathers, interesting enough, but I'm going to put one on the screen together for you today that actually is one of the prominent parts of teaching on fathering, and I am in danger of saying something profound today, okay? So those of you who normally, I see kind of dozing off, you got the soft pillows, you got four-inch foam, the AC falling on your face, I'm in danger. I have a thought that I want to say. I've written it down, so it's going to get out there, but it may be profound. It may not. Maybe it's just profound to me. That could be. But the scripture passage today, you read it on screen, I'll read it out loud. It's a combination of children. Oh, well, children aren't going to get off easy today uh, at all, because this is it's in context of fathers. And this is a passage you're really familiar with, and, and young people, I want you to listen. Those who are not, you know, still kids. That's right, everybody looking. You're on your gadgets, come off of them. I see everybody's eyes who is actually young. That's a bunch of folks here today, okay, younger than me, all right? Children, it says, obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment related to kids, related to families, with a promise. So that it may go with well, go well with you and that you may have a long life. My text says in the land. It's literally on the earth. Fathers, don't stir up your anger, stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, my daughter doesn't know that first part maybe as deeply. Children obey your parents, but she sure knows fathers do not frustrate your kids. Okay? She's got that one. And I'm okay with that. It's the scripture. It's the word to me. And I would say this. God doesn't waste time with words. He knows what we need to hear. Which means he would not say, fathers, do not cause anger to rise in your kid if you didn't have the power to do that. And you do have the power to do You know it, guys. I know it. Now, we would say this. I've always had a temper. At some point, someone's going to say, well, your, your kid has a temper, too. Why is that? Well, <laughs> fathers, do not cause anger to rise in your kids. Okay? That would be my translation here. Now, the passage... What I did for you, I did just a little bit of a grammatical um, layout here so you could see the difference in the phrases. But we could just kind of work through what the Apostle Paul is saying. Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord, in the Lord. In other words, children, this is an interesting thought, children are expected to obey the Lord. Okay? They're expected to obey their parents as you would the Lord, which means as the parents direct you to do what actually would be honorable to the Lord, you're to obey them. If your parents are asking you to do things that are immoral or illegal or against God's words, children, you're not expected to obey. Starts right off the bat. As a child, as soon as you can understand ultimately what right and wrong is, and it's supposed to have taught you when the parents come to you and they say you're going to do this or that and it actually is something you know inherently is wrong. You're still responsible for that action. Kids. This is why I really don't have uh, the, the age of accountability. I'm not sure I really buy fully into that. When your conscience, when the law of God starts operating on your life as a child, you know. Parents are, you're not a white sheet of paper. Parents have basically there to surface and experience what's already be written in you. you. You know right and wrong. You come with the package. You come with the conscience. You come with the law of God on your heart. So when that happens, and a parent says basically, this, he's saying, in the Lord, children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. 
Now, anybody who's listening to that particular statement should begin to get, guys, you start, should start to get a little bit of a cold chill. Because what is he saying? Children, you ought to obey your parents, mom and dad, as you would the Lord. Which means, what do your parents represent to you, child? What do the parents represent to the child? The Lord. It means, children, from the very beginning, their image of who God is and what he is and how he responds and how he loves and how he disciplines and how he rebukes and how he encourages, it happens they get that from where? From the parents. Obey your parents as you would the Lord. In other words, you're supposed to give your parents, kids, you're supposed to recognize that the Lord is operating through your parents to direct you in ways that are good and right. Obey them in reference to the, the awareness that the Lord's giving you your life. He's given your, these parents to obey. Obey your parents in the Lord as you would the Lord. Really? Obey my parents as in the Lord? But they're imperfect. But they don't know anything. Start saying by age 14, 15 or earlier. But they really don't have a clue. Or they're really too strict. Or they really, they got problems. Obey your parents as you would the Lord. The choice is right off the bat to recognize God's lordship over your life. Even as a child with respect to the parents you have. Now, they may not be around. Again, things happen. Divorces, separation, death. Eventually, they're not there, so you end up saying, how do I apply this truth when I don't have parents? And the scriptures begin to tell you, basically, this is why the family of God operates how the older men teach the younger men. The older women teach the younger women. You may come parentless, but you are not familyous. There's such a word. You're not without a family in the body of Christ. And spiritual men can take on kids who basically are orphaned with respect to your parents and help Parent them in the Lord. Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. The powerful truth here is ultimately to motivate you as kids, motivate me as kids. It says he, he draws upon this back in Exodus, uh, the Ten Commandments. He draws upon this fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Why? So that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Or literally, it's in the earth. He changes the phrasing. The original command was, oh, by the way, there's a land that is promised to you, and your experience in that land, which is connected to obedience to my word, literally, your crops, your land, your animals, your fruitfulness, your children, everything that, with respect to the human blessings, you're going to experience that when you honor your father and your mother. In the New Covenant, we don't have a particular land that we're heading to, but he's basically saying, on the earth, your life and your time on the earth is going to be blessed. Meaning, in a sense, the principle is, for the most part, you obey and you, you, you obey your parents as to the Lord. There's a sense in which God's sovereign way of bringing about things in your life is going to result in blessing versus you rebelling, versus you disobeying, versus you disrespecting. Those things are just darkness, right? Those are all darkness words. Disrespect, rebelling, anger against, revolting against, fighting against, lying against. Those are all darkness. Over here is respect. Over here is trust. Over is simply deference, reverence, respect, a sense of view of God's given me my parents. They are, they're flawed just like I am. But God gave them to me. It says there's promises here that ought to motivate kids, that perspective that God's in, responsible for your success in life. And it begins on how you, in the Lord, respond to mom and dad. Now, for the most part, we're a bit too late <laughs> to teach this, right? Could have been taught a long time ago. Scripture's been here a long time. But the way we raise up our families, the way that I become a husband, the way I become a father, should be in the context of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because early he says, I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church. 
So the context of family is going to be love for the Lord, submission to the Lord. And then when pet kids come along in that context, there's no question. You're a child. The reason you obey us is because God gave us to you. As God gave you to us. We're under him, you're under us. And under him. Now, Paul's saying this with a promise. Obey your parents as you would the Lord. Now, the profound thing that I would say this is, here, here it comes, okay? I've got it written down because of my memory times. Here's the promise. Our kids ought to experience our best understanding of what it is to be loved and led by the Lord Jesus Christ. Our kids ought to experience our best understanding of what it is to be loved and led by the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I'm talking a scripture biblical ideal. But that's why I said it the way I said it. Our kids ought to experience our best understanding in seeking the word, looking into the scriptures, saying this is the best understanding. I'm seeking to represent the lordship and love of Jesus Christ to you the best I know how. That ought to be the commitment of dads. And frankly, there are no new dads here that I know of. So I'm speaking to elder dads or grandparents or young men who will one day be dads. The commitment to be a godly dad begins long before you actually find out, hey, she's pregnant. The scary thing is, is when an individual, an individual decide not to honor the lordship of Jesus Christ with respect to marriage and a baby emerges, we've already crossed two bridges at least that we should not have crossed. One, the lordship of your own life, the lordship of how marriage is to be conducted, and then on the other side, you, you're expecting an individual to operate in lordship with a child who doesn't understand lordship in marriage or lordship personally in their life. God's word. God's word is um, wonderfully unshakable. says there's promises in the land when you honor your father and your mother as unto the Lord. So I'm speaking to the children in a sense. If you want to honor the Lord and you want the blessings of God on your life and on your marriage and on your parenting, then you have to make the commit really early to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ personally and attach yourself to someone else who understands that. So that that teaching can run right through your life. doesn't make you a perfect Christian family. You're just simply aligning yourself with what God says. This is how I bless families. That's the kid's perspective. Now for us as dads. Verse 4. Fathers don't stir anger in your children. But instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The children are to submit to us as parents as unto the Lord, and they're to submit to this because dad is going to be actually seeking to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Not only are you to view as a parent, now I'm, I'm viewing you mom and dad as of the Lord, but I'm receiving from you the instruction of the Lord. And I love what he says, bringing them up. It's a beautiful image. Recognizing they are small, they are smaller, they are tinier, they are younger, they are newer, we said, okay? They're more flexible, they're, they're new, they're in formation, and it's the idea of helping them up, bringing them up, not pushing them down, but bringing them up. Bringing them up, recognizing that the trend of a child is to grow. So in other words, he's saying bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord instead of what? Stirring up anger. Something's coming up. Something's going to come up. It's either going to be a child in anger or it's going to be a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Something's going to rise. It's just the way growing things do. 
And it's going to rise. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children. That's literally what the scripture says. Don't stir up anger in your children. Our children are built in with anger. Hendrick said as a commentator of the book of Ephesians, he, he lists some ways in which parents like me can become guilty of, ex, of exasperating or raising up anger in our kids. Overprotection. Favoritism. Discouragement. Failure to make allowance for the fact that the child is growing up and has a right to have ideas of his or her own. The need to not be an exact copy of his father to be a success. Simple neglect and then bitter words and outright physical cruelty. I would say, as I do that list together, if you realize, and I realize, that having children has wonderful benefits, but it can have wonderful consequences. That child could grow up in anger, or they can grow up in the nurture and admonition, one text says, or the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Our kids ought to experience our best understanding of what it is to be loved and led by the Lord Jesus. But he warns us, dads, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. What would be the positive side of these negatives? Negatives are one thing. They don't offer anything. They just say, hey, here's how we're doing it wrong. Here's how we're messing up. Here's what can make us angry. Some good ways, maybe, dads, is to allow kids to fail. Absolutely not. My kid never fails. He's my kid. No. If you never allow them to fail, when they do fail as an adult, they will fall far. It'll feel alien to them. Wait, I never failed. I was committed. I, was, I, I, I got every award all the way through. Oh, yeah, everybody does today. I got an award for just being alive. Here's my sticker. Here's my band. Here's my trophy. You're just alive. You're alive. Nobody fails. Life isn't that way. The realities of life are not that way. You're going to try something. You're going to try a relationship. You're going to try a job. You're going to try something. You're going to venture out. You're going to find out not everybody's for you. And you're going to fail. And you're going to hurt. And then your thoughts in your mind is, why does this hurt so bad? What, why? I never experienced this. Why was I not equipped to deal with failure? Well, it's because we are, as parents, there's no way we want to see our kids fail. It's my kid. When they need to be given the opportunity to know that if they can fall, they can fail forward. Failure is how we learn. It is my life. Fail. Struggle. Sense the defeat. Sense the loss. Don't achieve the goal fully. Maybe you'll think a little bit differently about the next one. Failure. How about parenting commitment? We got more child than one. We only have one to, uh, so we could be accused, as single parents can be accused of, of having favoritism. We got just one, so she's overcooked, right? <laughs> she's strong, she's affirming, she's um, not supposed to talk about it without permission, but <laughs> she's very independent, she's got mind, she's just very uh, focused, she's got all kinds of qualities that are coming out, and um, but she gets the heat and the, and the wind and the breeze. You have multiple kids, multiple kids, the challenge there is there for favoritism. The challenge is to begin to know how they all operate differently and making commitments, tangible commitments that are the same for each one 
is the way that it is normally thought through. How you deal with each individual personality is choices you make all along the way. But every single one gets the same foundation, same basis, same commitment and love. Words of lifting. Words versus discouragement are going to over-succeed us. They may succeed beyond us. They may see, succeed in different ways. They may show their, their basically their character and their personalities and their giftedness in different ways, but there's words of lifting. Lifting words. I believe in you. I love you. I'm excited about what God is going to do in and through your life. Surrender your life to him. You're, you're caring a person. You're very organized, and that's benefiting where you are. Where, whatever the words are, you just you know what it feels like to get good words. Fish them out. Kids need them more than, than ever. Four, celebrate maturing in identity. Instead of resisting their maturing in identity, celebrate it. Child is growing up. They have ideas of their own. Or not to be an exact copy just because you say it so. That's one that can pay dividends a long way ahead if that mistake is made. You're going to be a great this, you're going to be a great that, because I'm a great this or great that. It's one thing to pass on a legacy. It's one thing to pass on a trade. It's one thing to pass on an interest. And a child makes that decision. It's another to say, you're three years old. You're already going to be in the trade. And to me, I guess the idea is just simply, ultimately, that the kids are not about you and me. They're to be raised in the Lord. They belong to the Lord. He's the master craftsman. We're going to help them and make them develop who they, they are. Commend the newest expression of you. The newest expression of you. I like seeing report cards with age. I can't help it. I never had those. <laughs> I never had those. And Deb, I say that, Deb looks at me like, and we just finished the doctor. Uh, I'm not a quitter. <laughs> I got that quality for later. I'm not a quitter. Seven graduations later. That doesn't mean I'm a genius. I'm an A student. It just means I'm, I'm a plotter. So, I don't know if it's so much an expression of me or an expression of Deb. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not me, then it must be Deb. I love the idea of the newest expression of you. You're not the final end goal of anything. Just think about the combination of ideas of DNA just itself, all the variations. Not one person, even twins, I'm a twin, even twins are not exactly alike. Every single person is unique and specifically intricately crafted differently in God's purposes, plans for his mosaic, uh, his portrait of what he desires, what glorifies him. We've got to believe that. We have to believe that even when there's a, a deviation of desire. I'm trusting God for that. Keep love consistent. Number six versus bitter words or number five, neglect. Keep love consistent. I think to me this is the hardest thing in the home. The home by God's design was to be an atmosphere of his love. And when that atmosphere is not there, when that language is not being spoken consistently, when actually it's either being negotiated, you do this and I'll dispense love to you if you do what's right. If, the, if, the, if any kind of negotiation or bartering or performance system that basically says the love will start flowing to you when you start doing what's right. I thought about that today. You know the story of the prodigal son? You know the prodigal son messed up badly, didn't he? Where did the prodigal son get his money? He got it from his father. 
<laughs> what kind of dad was that? Dad, I want a happy inheritance, which I don't always want to get when you're dead. Now, is that respectful? Is that honorable? No. Dad says, fine. Split it down the middle. Take it. Think the dad didn't know where the money's going to go? Dad knew exactly what the heart of the kid was, his, this son was. He knew exactly, I'm giving you 250 grand or more, whatever it is. God gave him the money to go party with. I say God. The <coughs> father gave him the money to go party with. Always my son. Always looking for the son to come back over the hillside. Stone broke, broken, repentant, shameful, disgraceful, dishonorable. No, no. Father greets him with a big hug. Runs to him. God's love is not in question for us. He always loves us no matter how bad we dishonor him and mess up in life. His love is a non-negotiable. It is unconditional. He is love. He loved us from the beginning of the time before we existed. He loves you. He loves me as his kids. We're his kids. He can only just keep loving. And sometimes his love even allows him, basically provides the freedom within God to actually provide what it is we're going to use against him. How we're going to basically disobey. And how we're going to destroy. And how we're going to actually hurt ourselves. How we're going to bring shame to him. His love is not conditional on my behavior. He is grieved. He experiences dishonor. And he will discipline. And sometimes actually. Actually can shorten the life of one of his kids. You're done sinning. Disgraceful. But I love you. You're mine. In the home, love was to, to be this consistent, unconditional awareness. That was to bring about what actually is new life, new expression. Keep love consistent. That's a challenge for us as parents, to keep love consistent. We want to reward everything that happens good. Sometimes stuff is going to happen bad, and then we've got a choice as to whether we're going to say, okay, cold shoulder, shunning, everything's going to change. You messed up. And those are really the points in time in which we are really to draw near. What do you say? You're hurting us. You're, you're, you're just dishonoring God. You're, you're uh, grieving us. Our uh, hearts are breaking. You are or experiencing sorrow and sadness about your behavior, your choices, your life, but you are always our son. You are always our daughter. We love you. That's not even on the table. Uh, it's because love is the only means by which the change and the flourishing is going to take place. It's God's oversight. He honors this. Fathers, don't stir up your anger in your children, but bring them up in the discipline instruction of the Lord. Discipline has to do with actually correcting, saying this is the way to go, this is not the way to go. This is a way of light, this is a way of darkness. This is a way of benefit and blessing and obedience to God's word. This is disobedience and pain and loss and side effects. This is awareness of the light and the darkness. But also the instruction is the word of mouth, advice, encouragement, counsel. There is a point in which parents are available for counsel, but they're not responsible to continue to give it. When kids reach actually an adult recognition, a life of adulthood, they are on their own. They are not on their own, they are owning their own. Now, when I look at the passage, it says, Fathers, don't stir up your anger in your children. That doesn't seem to have any expiration point. Bad news for you, kid. We can exasperate you for the rest of our lives. <laughs> it's just, we're going to parent you only so far, but we can make you angry for the rest of our lives. Isn't that, isn't that good to know? It's just kind of a, the present tense. It just says, keep on, stop stirring. 
just kind of just keeps on going. The sad thing, guys, we can not only do it in childhood and parenting, but any time they come back into our circle as a grown adult, we can keep that fire burning. We can keep that kindling going. We can keep stirring up that anger. We can just keep throwing wood there in the furnace. Now, our kids ought to experience our best understanding of what it is to be loved and led by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my prayer today. And again, we have some dads here today, more grandfathers. Few great grandfathers, maybe. And my prayer today for us as dads is that my daughter, together with Deborah, that she would experience the best understanding of what it is to be loved and led by the Lord Jesus Christ. I say that because I want her to get hooked on his love. Because if she doesn't get hooked on his love, she's going to misinterpret it for the rest of her life. She doesn't get the real thing, then she's going to buy into the counterfeit. And there are gazillions of counterfeits. So this isn't just any small thing. Our kids interpret God's love through how we parent. And they misinterpret it also by how we parent. One of the spokesmen last night on the video, or Friday night in the video that we showed, said, you know, Dad, one of the things we ought to get good at no matter what season in life we're in is repenting. That's what we ought to get good at, is repenting. Oh God, my Father, I have not represented Jesus, your Son, to the best way possible to my child, to my children, to my wife. I repent. I turn away from that experience, that memory. I turn to you for cleansing, for forgiveness and grace. And I want to begin to speak into the lives of my children, whether it's a first marriage, a second marriage, a third marriage. I want to speak into the life of my children on behalf of my best understanding of who Jesus is. Wherever I am in life, I can't go back there. I'm not going back to those kids. They don't even do it. I'm not going back there. I'm saying redemptively, Scripture, this is the way that you actually act out your father. You are a dad. You are a father. God used you to bring your children into existence. It's an opportunity to, under his lordship, obey the Scriptures to the best of your Ability. How they respond to it, no idea. It's not really about their response, it's about ours. Fathers, you want something. We want something at the end of life. We want something. We want to finish well. I do. And I want, uh, in my mind, in my soul, I would trade everything else, really, in life. I, I, I trade the education that I had too much of. I would trade all the ministry years, some 30 years of ministry, whatever, uh, which I think is worth something. I would trade just for my marriage and, and my daughter to know the love of Jesus Christ to the best of my understanding. I like what Andy Stanley says. He says, your greatest work in life may be simply raising a child that loves God. <coughs> Man, he pastors a church of about 18,000 people. It's nice when it comes from him. Because that's kind of successful in our Christian world. But in his mind, trade it all so that my kids would ultimately experience the love of Jesus Christ fully. How they respond to it, again, they have that opportunity. As parents, we think, as moms, as dads, 
we continue to have not just a parenting role of actually suppressing them and parenting them through every decision, but we still have the power to elevate anger in them or to alleviate that anger. And repentance, for the most part, is where that begins. I want to allow an opportunity uh, just for prayer, guys. It's not just so much an invitation or put them to the spot. But our dads here, I want you to invite, we're going to sing a song that I love. It's kind of a promise keeper song. That's what I think of it as. Let it be said of us. It's one of those long-term prayers. But guys, if you're still fathering or you've got a, you're a grandfather and you feel kind of the weight of fathering in your home, I want you to come and join me as we just kind of kneel here and we just say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Help me to display and live out the best of my understanding of what it is to follow you and obey you and experience your love to my kids, to my grandkids, whatever it is. That's all I'm asking. If, if you're not led to do that, don't, don't move. But if there's an awareness in your life, you know that there's something in my life not only to commit to the Lord, something I need to come and repent of and leave it here at the front and go back to my seat. <coughs> So it's not blocking the opportunity God wants for me to be used by him to bless my kids, grandkids, whatever. So let's stand together as we respond. If you're led to join me in prayer, I'll be kneeling right here because I'm the dad greatest in me. But if that's where you want to be, then just sing this song, and as you're led just to come and go, just stay as long as